All right, Janet Guthrie, welcome to Coffee with Kyle. I have, I can't tell you how excited that I have been when we had the opportunity. And let me be clear, this is an opportunity. This is an, it's an honor to sit here. So I'm just like all of them, I'm gonna start at the very beginning. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Well, I was actually born in Iowa City, where my father was running the Iowa City Airport at the time, and he celebrated my birth by doing loops outside the hospital windows. Uh, but uh, within uh, a year and a half, he uh, went to fly for Eastern Airlines out of New York City. And, um, and then we went to Miami, briefly to Atlanta, I remember I learned to tie my shoes in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, then we moved to Miami for the rest of my life. You know, you, you mentioned it. Your dad did loops outside the hospital. I was fascinated to, to see that you really started flying. When you were 13, it was one of the first times you went up and, and your dad kind of gave you lessons, started to give you lessons. Was that the nature of who Janet Guthrie was? I'm going to try everything. Well, I was born adventurous and grew up insufficiently socialized <laughs> out in the country, piney woods, nobody around for miles. It's all suburbs now, of course. But uh, no, I would beg my father for flying lessons, but I was very relieved when he turned me over to an instructor whose flight <laughs> whose flight instructor is reading his parent. Listen, I, I, I understand what it's like when your dad finally gives you to somebody else to learn because it's tough to learn from your parents. I, I do know that. I've walked in those shoes a little bit. The exiting of the aircraft uh, with a parachute, I didn't get that part, okay? I, I, I have to be honest with you. I wasn't quite sure. At 16, you decide, okay, this is something I really want to do. I want to jump. Well, that's, that's true. Um, and um, my father said he had made a parachute jump once, which I hadn't known. He happened upon a, a guy who had been a Batman in the 20s or thereabouts who had parachutes that he would lend me. So we went to see this guy. And I saw that he thought this was my father's idea, but it wasn't my father's idea. <laughs> Um, and so he, um, he said it's about like jumping off the roof of a house. So I put a ladder up against the roof and I started jumping off and practicing landing rules until finally I could jump off the roof. I mean, I didn't do this without any preparation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, it was great. It was the first great adventure of my life. That's, that's fascinating that... You, you, you went and practiced by, by jumping off the house. Now, listen, that's one of those things that my mother used to say, if everybody else jumped off the house, would you jump off the house? And my answer was always no. And she's like, but then don't do what everybody else does. So that's the road I chose was not. So, but, but it was okay for you to jump. I got that. Your mother was a very wise woman. <laughs> so was he accepting of you? learning to fly? I, yes. I mean, there wasn't any particular encouragement. It was just that they didn't say, no, you can't do that. Yeah. So um, I had a, a commercial license by the time I was 20 and was ferrying airplanes up and down the East Coast from Washington, D.C. to Miami. I did that for a little bit after I went to work for Republic Aviation as an aerospace engineer. That's another piece of your, your puzzle that I am fascinated by. Um, you end up at, at the University of Michigan, you study physics, and then you end up, as you said, at, at Republic Aviation and Research and Development. Um, you were flying, women couldn't be commercial pilots, but you applied to be a, an astronaut. A friend of mine at work came in one day with a copy of an aviation magazine and said, look at this. He said, you fit all these requirements except where it says doctorate. He says, the work you've been doing here the last four years, if you'd done it at a university, you'd have a doctorate. So to make a long story short, I ended up with a nice letter from Deke Slayton, one of the original seven, saying, nice try. Don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> I did get through the first couple of rounds of eliminations, but that was that. So 
if, I, if as we rewind and we go, okay, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in a plane at 13. Uh, I'm jumping out of a plane at 16 or 17. I'm off to college. I'm studying physics. I'm applying uh, to be an astronaut. I'm doing R&D. And oh, yes, I'm going to do some, some hill climbs and some rallies, and I'm going to start racing a little bit. When did that come about? How did that come into enter your life? Well, I remember the big watershed very well. Someone had offered me a half share in an AT-6 World War II training plane for $650. They sell for hundreds of thousands <laughs> nowadays. And that plane could do six Gs positive and six Gs negative. I could do outside loops. It could do all sorts of stuff. Thought about all the traffic in Long Island, the traffic control zones, the planes coming in from Europe, what was then called Idlewild and at LaGuardia and Newark. And I thought, you know, there's no place I can go around here. And so I went away and I bought an XK120 Jaguar coupe instead, just because it was such a beautiful thing. So that was what I drove to work every day. Then I found out what I could do with it. The one car at a time trials that are now called autocross or solo, um, and then hill climbs. And then I discovered sports car racing existed. So in 1963, I got my first Sports Car Club of America license, and things went on from there. Obviously, you're an incredibly fast learner because you went from 1963 uh, with a sports car license to 1967 as a class winner at Sebring, uh, which is one of the most iconic races in the United States. At Sebring, let's see, the first year I won my class there, I was in a Matra up against these huge fast cars designed to win races of this sort overall. And in fact, 1970 was the year that Mario took over uh, someone else's car and he was something like a lap down at that point. And in the last hour, I was bringing my little car to first in class at the time, but I'll tell you, I have never seen such driving in my life. This is what Mario Andretti did that night. <laughs> At some point in time, um, you know, you, you've won Sebring, you've won your class twice, and, and 72 that, that you decided, okay, this is something I'm going to do full time. Listen, you have lived a full life to 1972 when, when I look at everything that you packed in that. Uh, but then 76 comes along and you get a call. I'm going I'm to jump way forward. You get a call to, to come to Indianapolis. Um, and to drive an Indy car. Yes, there she is, Janet Guthrie, part of the 1976 Indianapolis crop of rookie drivers. Well, um, I actually, uh, that was Rallo Volstead, and he got my answering machine, and yes, they did have answering machines. Back then. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, right, another joker. So the next morning, I called Chris Economaki, the, the editor of National Speed Sport News, who knew what was going to happen to every driver in the country before it happened to them. And I said to Chris, who is Rala Volstead? And Chris filled me in and assured me that Rala was real. I was wary because a couple of women had gotten egg on their faces by announcing they were going to drive at Indianapolis and then it never happened. And so we talked for a while and I said, okay, here's my condition. We have a private test. And if you like me and I like you and the car goes fast enough and I can make the car goes, go fast enough, then you can make whatever publicity noise about it you feel like you need to, but until then it's our secret. And the test went well and we went on from there. Two things. What were your emotions walking through that gate, knowing that you had this opportunity? And what was the reaction um, from the garage area? Well, it was, it was intimidating. Um, I have taken off airplanes from landing strips shorter than these straightaways. 
Uh, I mean, when you first see that place, it's unbelievable. Um, there was Dick Simon, who was my teammate, the number one driver on the team. If I remember right, he took the car out first. And it was a car, I learned, that all-time sprint car champion Tom Bigelow had not been able to put in the field the previous year. So hard as we worked at it, I never did bring it up to qualifying speed. And uh, if Tom Bigelow couldn't, I guess I shouldn't feel too bad. That I <laughs> Every time she set out to run the two-phase driver's test, something broke. It was as though a power higher than her frustrated chief mechanic, Rolla Balstead, was taking a deterring hand. When it became clear, approaching the second weekend of qualifying, that the blue car was not going to come up to speed, Rolla went out looking for a car for me to drive that was capable of making the field, a car that wouldn't be his. A.J. Foyt agreed to let me take his car out and practice. So at noon on the last day of qualifying, uh, there I was getting ready to get into A.J. Foyt's car <laughs> that was worth about a hundred times more than everything of value I owned in the whole, whole world. <laughs> and I had to bring it up at least close to its potential without doing it in a harm. Oh my Lord, talk about pressure. Uh, and um, I, so I did bring it up to speed. It was quite a different animal. And I did run it fast enough to make the field. But over the course of that day, I just decided not to let me make a qualifying attempt with it. So I had to wait until the following year. When you roll in the Indy, every eye uh, worldwide, seemed to be on Indianapolis, but there were one, was one set of eyes on you um, that, that month, maybe more laser focused than anybody else's, and that was H.A. Humpy Wheeler from Charlotte, North Carolina. And, and I saw where he said, I waited 45 minutes, and then I called her uh, to see if she would come, come south. First of all, I asked me, he said, uh, do you want to stay here, or would you rather go down and take a shot at Charlotte? And I said, Rala, stay here and bask in the whatever or go drive another race car? Surely you know me better than that <laughs> than to ask that now. Uh, so away I went, and it was sort of like Indianapolis all over again. She'll never make the field, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I very well might not have made the field had it not been for the late, great Junior Johnson. The car arrived at the track three days late, and it could not get out of its own way. It was terrible. But one of the things that Rala Volstead had done, Cale Yarborough had driven for him at Indianapolis once, and Rala had called Cale and asked Cale to take the car out and practice. And he went something like a tenth of a second faster than I did. I mean, it was, was really disgraceful. And here comes Junior Johnson. Oh, my God. <laughs> One of the greatest NASCAR drivers of all time for whom Cale was driving at that time. And he looked at Cale and he turned to Herb Nab, his crew chief, and said, give them the setup. Now, I knew perfectly well what a huge gift that was. When I went back out again, it was a different animal. There were a lot of stopwatches and a lot of hands because word had gone around the only way I could make the field was if NASCAR fa falsified my time. But I did make the field, quite honestly. <laughs> and the row in front of me consisted of Dale Earnhardt Sr. and Bill Elliott. So I was in, and, uh, and that was the beginning of the World 600. That's pretty good company. Two Hall of Famers right there in front of you in, in your first race. Janice, some of the other drivers said that uh, one of their worries when you first came in here was that you weren't physically uh, up to manhandling a 3,700-pound car. How physically exhausting is driving your car? 
Well, that's that's really just nonsense. Uh, yeah, after all, as, as Christine Becker said, you don't have to carry it, you just sit in it. And I, although it is certainly tiring, as anyone here will tell you, it is not beyond the capability of any reasonably fit woman. The, the, the other thing, I, I guess, to me is, and, and I laughed about it when I, when I saw it, is you, you left Indianapolis and you said you headed to NASCAR land. What were your feelings and emotions walking into there and how were you accepted? Um, I ran into a woman um, out in the women's room in the infield because of course there was no women's room in the garage area. And I was changing into my driver's suit and I came out and here is this um, lovely woman with her blonde hair teased up to about here somewhere and her false eyelashes on. And she says to me, oh, I'm so tired. I was up until four this morning. I was lapping in the valves. And I said, what? And she said, uh, yes, I'm Katie. Oh, I can't come up with the last Ballard. Name. Ballard, Katie Ballard. Ballard. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hey, ma'am. Uh, Katie, but she says, I'm Katie Ballard. I'm married to Walter Ballard, and I build all his engines. And I said, well, how come you're not in the garage area with the rest of the crew? And she said, oh, I wouldn't do that. That's for the man. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the attitude. Here she's building the racing engines, but she's not going to go in the garage area. It was a fascinating time. I knew sponsors had female executives that couldn't come in the garage area and were paying money for their car to be in the garage area. We, we moved forward, it had a great run. The main thing is you ran the whole race. The 600 was a test for cars, but also a test for, for the drivers. When you crawled out of that thing at the end, um, did you knew that you had accomplished something? Well, yes. I uh, Actually, I was suffering from nausea at that point because the headers had cracked and I'd been getting carbon monoxide through the cockpit for the last, oh, I don't know, a couple hours probably. So I, it, it took me a while to recover, but uh, one of my crew guys that Rala had sent down from Indianapolis to be there for me, tears were trickling down from behind his sunglasses. It was, it was quite an emotional moment. If we move, we move to 77, um, you make the, the Indy race, you make the Daytona 500, first, first female driver to make both of those races. Um, in the, in the same year, we we moved to, uh, to to the following year, and Daytona was not a good good was not kind to you in, in '78. Uh, but Indianapolis was a fine moment. What was the '78 Indianapolis 500 like for you? This Janet Guthrie, by the way, the only woman ever to drive in Indianapolis. I I didn't have a ride of any sort for the Indianapolis 500, and I had spent the whole winter searching for sponsorship and and at the end of March I got help from a guy who was a professional fundraiser and got me on Good Morning, Morning America where David Hartman gave me the perfect questions and Jerry Pillersdorf was his name the fundraiser made sure that Texaco was watching we met with the guys from Texaco's advertising agency, I, and his boss, the guy who headed the Texaco account, turned it down. And this fellow, of his own accord, went to Texaco and made the presentation, and Texaco bit. Pulling in for a pit stop, Janet Guthrie. When I pull in, sometimes I want full service. And sometimes I'd rather serve myself. Hi, Janet. Hi, Buck. Well, that happened one month before the opening of practice. So I had to acquire the car, get the crew, and um, I, it worked out well with a top 10 finish. So that was good. A lot of people said a woman could never drive 500 miles, and here you are. Tell us a little about the feeling of the race. Well, that's nonsense, Sam. I mean, I've been running these 500, 600 mile stock car races down south for two years now, and, and this, this is really easier you know, than, than uh, 
uh, horsing a, uh, a stock car around. Those tractors are rough, they're all high bank. Here, of course, everything's very precise, very delicate. It's more mentally fatiguing, but they're the physical. Sam, I was driving with one hand. <laughs> uh, I want to, I want, I'm going to shift from the racing part of it a little bit. 60s and 70s um, was, was a different time. Feminism and the women's movement started. We had the civil rights in, from, from the 60s. So much in society was changing. And, and I look at it and, it and it strikes me now in 2019, 2020, 2021, we're seeing the same type of movement. You, at that time, were competing door to door, bumper to bumper, head to head, um, and what was, had been, and was still considered by those guys, a, a man's world. Did you think about that? Or were you just, again, a race car driver going out there just getting it done? In my mind, I was just a race car driver and the woman part made no difference whatsoever. And it certainly was a pleasure to me to um, see that more widely recognized after I had <clears throat> driven at Indianapolis and Daytona and so on and so forth. Um, but um, there was no denying the responsibility. Um, I didn't even know about the big parade through downtown Indianapolis the first time I put a car in the field. Guys with little girls in their hands sort of picking them up and waving them at me as if they thought what I had done augured well for their daughter's future. And I, I did hear that quite a lot. And so, as I say, I came to feel it as a responsibility. That's not why I did it, but it's uh, why I came to feel it as a responsibility. Yeah, it, it, it appears, and, and, and I had heard that story, and thank you for for talking about the parade. I'd heard, heard and read that. And, and I thought that's the moment that it came together for you. You as a race car driver, you had a platform and you could use that platform for the women's movement, for, for the future, for the future of, of little girls that are standing there saying, I can do that. I can be that astronaut. I can be that race car driver. And, and I read where you said um, that that at, at a little bit later date where you said you knew if you screwed it up, it would be you were messing the chances up or screwing up the chances for a long time. What, what did you mean by that? Oh, I meant that if I made a mistake of some sort, a serious mistake of some sort, that it would be a very long time before another woman got a chance at the top levels of racing. And um, I, I'm sure it did make a, a difference. I mean, look at Danica's first race at Indianapolis. Um, she had top-notch equipment and made the most of it. Danica, you have completed your first Indianapolis 500 with an outstanding effort. What is the emotion? I'm relieved. Um, I thought for a second we were gonna win that thing at the end. So, and, and you bring up Danica, and Danica is, is, is the perfect example. And, and we've talked a lot recently with, with Bubba Wallace. You know, we had Wendell Scott back in the early 60s who ran until the, till the early 70s. But then it was a long, long time before a Bubba Wallace comes along. Janet Guthrie had an impact on motorsports, not just NASCAR, not just IndyCar, but on motorsports for a long time, it seemed like before someone else really came along um, and embraced it. Why is it a, a path that a lot of people haven't followed? Well, you have to say first off that it is an incredibly expensive sport. I mean, millions and millions of dollars to run a full season in Indy cars. And I don't know what it costs in NASCAR nowadays, but it's obviously solid layup into the, into the seven figures. Um, that's a lot of money to spend on anyone. If you look at, at our sport, if you look at motorsports, um, and you look at how the world changed in the 60s and 70s and how the world is changing now, 
do you see a time where it will be more open because of corporate involvement? We see corporations talk to talk, but not walk to walk. It's, it's hard to predict. Um, there is a, a woman corporate executive, executive forming a team for Indianapolis this year. And she has the cooperation of Roger Penske, than whom there is no greater. And uh, Simona de Silvestro is driving, and she has the talent. And I can hardly wait to see how that goes. All right, I'm going to read something you said um, as, as we close here. You are so eloquent in how you speak of, of driving, what it means to to your soul and what it means to your spirit and, and how it changed. And it says, I find racing life enhancing. It contributes immensely to all the rest that life has to offer. It represents more than I could have ever dreamed of. Wouldn't have happened, wouldn't have happened for you 10 years ago before the women's movement had such a strong effect. But the women's movement created an opportunity. And you end that quote with, I guess I was ready for it. And I have to say this, Okay, the world may not have been ready for Janet Guthrie in the 70s. Um, we would be more ready now, I would like to think. But you were ready for it, and you had an impact on motorsports uh, that's undeniable. You had an impact on motorsports that we still feel today. And as a motorsports kid growing up in NASCAR and watching every bit of it, I thank you for that. And I thank you for being a part of, of Coffee with Kyle today. Well, Kyle, thank you so much. This has been absolutely a delight. You're really good. Thank you. Hey, Motorsports fans, thanks for watching. Make sure you hit subscribe before you go for all the latest news and highlights across motorsports.